Hunt, uh, who's a policy officer for Eco Innovation. Very interesting presentation this morning, Michiel. Thank you. Um, my first question to you actually is that the, the whole focus and tenor of, of, of this conference is recycling and supporting the circular economy. Um, and I'm bound to ask, um, in that kind of context, what is the rationale for a bioplastics alternative to oil-based uh, plastics that are already out there? Thank you for the question. Um, I think when we um, look into circular economy and how bioplastics can play a role, one has to distinguish between bio-based plastics, so which tells something about feedstock, and compostable or biodegradable plastics, which mm. says something about the pathway after the plastics have been used. Mm. Um, in line with the circular economy decoupling from finite fossil feedstock, bio-based plastics, or more widely the bioeconomy, uh, plays an important role. And then thinking about the two uh, cycles within the circular economy, the technical cycle, the biological cycle, it's in also important to understand how compostable materials or biodegradable materials can play a role in closing the biological loop. So, for example, as we've seen, there are um, uh, cases where compostable bags are used to facilitate the collection of organic waste. So that would be a typical targeted application where compostable material can play a role. The whole uh, philosophy underpinning the circular economy, it, I, I've always believed, is because we have a diminishing resource in, in, in oil-based uh, plastics. Um, I don't think the same is true for bio-based drop-ins. Uh, which we can just grow ad infinitum every year. So why do we need to feed them back into a circular uh, scenario? So, in my opinion, the circular economy goes beyond decoupling from fossil feedstock. So it is about designing out waste. It's about designing your system in such a way that products and materials retain their value. And it's about re generating and restoring natural systems. So if we take this broader view, um, we go beyond replacing fossil feedstock. Um, so indeed, drop-in bio-based materials can uh, play a role in order to move away from fossil feedstock. Mm. But at the same time, it's important to think how innovation into materials, which could be bio-based materials, bio-based plastics, can go beyond a simple one-to-one -one replacement of fossil-based materials. So it's trying to understand how innovation and research into materials, products, business models can go beyond the, uh, the benefits we see nowadays. So it's harnessing the current benefits, but then actually take us a step further, leading to better economic and environmental outcomes. It almost seems like it's a moral imperative too. Um, I guess that depends on your values, but we clearly see both economic drivers, environmental and social drivers to take action. And obviously, uh, once you go beyond the, the business case, but also venture into, do we have an environmental issue we would like to overcome? Are there uh, social shortcomings we would like to address? Yes, I agree, then, then you're close to a, a moral uh, debate too. And I guess if we take better care of the environment and our resources, we might take better care of each other too. Um, just looking at, uh, and you mentioned decoupling, so looking at the compostable uh, side of all of this. 50% um, of, of marine waste was uh, single-use plastic, I think it came up. Um, isn't there time for some mandatory legislation on, on what kind of plastic should be used for what kind of application? So I'm glad you asked. Obviously, as a policymaker, um, one could think that, um, or one could contemplate on whether we need to have a top-down, clear mandate uh, on whether certain applications or certain materials should be used for certain applications. I think in the spirit of the proposed directive, it's about preventing and reducing the impact of certain uh, plastic products mm. on the environment, mm. as well as promoting a transition to a circle economy through innovation into business models, products and materials. From that point of view, and in line with the innovation pr principle, we uh, try to remain material neutral and outcomes oriented, which means that we have uh, a specific outcome in mind, in this case, as said, prevention and reduction of, of certain impact. Whether one should go as far as to say, oh, this application should be this polymer, I think um, it's a debate to have. Uh, when 
thinking about specific targeted applications where you could wonder whether the outcome of biodegradability could be valuable or compostability in, well, by intention could be valuable for a certain application. Yes, I think it's, it's a debate worth having. Do we have a plan straightforward to say this application should be this polymer? No, and, and perhaps we shouldn't go as far too. Fair enough. Um, we, it, at this conference, it, it, it always comes down to um, investment and cost and scale. Uh, and the biggest disincentive towards a bio-based alternative always appears to fall into that bag. I mean, is the EU able to help in this respect to encourage uh, brand owners to uh, adopt more bio-based solutions? Uh, the EU is uh, definitely able to, uh, to help in this respect. So I think um, there are a couple of relevant policy domains where actions are being taken. Uh, so first of all, uh, from a global perspective, there's a Paris Agreement. So if we can decouple from fossil feedstock, um, uh, this would help us achieving or contributing to this goal. More precisely on the bioeconomy and moving towards a bioeconomy, the, the EU is already taking uh, measures. So there's the updated bioeconomy strategy, which uh, talks about uh, 1 million euros investment platform, it talks about uh, policy support to member states, it talks about a clear regulatory framework with standards and labeling, it's uh, talking about uh, supporting uh, uh, innovations in bioeconomy and ac having actual pilots in different areas uh, across uh, Europe. So. Yes, I think there's a range, range of measures that could be put in place or are being put in place that the Commission or the European Union uh, could be carrying out. Yes. Very good. Lastly, um, well, not quite lastly, actually, how are you going to get countries like the US and the Far East to get on board with, with, with uh, what we're calling in England the war against waste? Um, I'll, I'll, I would like to position it slightly more positively, so it's a transition towards a circular economy right. uh, which uh, aims to, to harness the benefits we see nowadays, in this case of plastics, uh, but at the same time overcome some of the challenges we, we clearly see. Uh, and also from that light I see two uh, motivators in order to involve international partners. So on the one hand there's an economic case to be made, we're going to lift the entire in this case plastics economy, so more broadly circle economy. Um, so there's a clear um, uh, economic driver retaining the value and actually making a business case out of it. And on the other hand, there's the global issue of marine littering. So there's also a clear urge globally uh, to tackle this issue. And the European Commission or European Union more generally is already acting with uh, international partners in during, well, through platforms like G7, G20, United Nations and so on to, to tackle this together. Well, good luck on that, I think. Um, and, and lastly, in terms of getting people to come on board, um, the one sort of missing component in all of this is invariably the consumer who might say one thing, think another thing, but actually do something else entirely. How can we get consumers more engaged in supporting the principle of a circular economy when effectively we're asking them to help other people to make money? It's a good one, and I guess it's a, it's a recurring challenge. Um, so what we've learned looking at the plastic system in the past few decades is that we can't simply rely on the citizen to, to fix the system. So we, taking a step back, we'll have to bring the actors of the entire value chain together mm -hmm. and uh, design a better system. Obviously, citizens being part of this system also have a role to play mm. and I think when we focus on citizens as an actor within the supply chain it's important to uh, increasingly so apply behavioral insights. I guess in the past uh, those insights might have been uh, neglected or not applied sufficiently uh, and as you then rightly so refer to uh, people would say A but do B uh, leading to some of the issues we see nowadays.